First of all, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everybody. Um, thank you for joining us uh, and giving us a little bit of your time on this very interesting topic: unraveling AI's hidden hurdles in test automation. AI, in this case, as we know, refers to artificial intelligence, and we will definitely get our hands dirty with some use cases and understand not just the hurdles but also opportunities using AI for test automation. My name is Robin. Uh, I'm the VP of Engineering at Provart. So I head uh, the engineering product delivery parts at Provart. Uh, close to 15 years experience now. Uh, yep, dabbled with uh, some technology. I wouldn't say a lot, still learning. Uh, I'm AI curious, uh, expert by no means, and also heading uh, AI related delivery at Provart. So that's about me. I have my partner in crime as Indu. So over to Indu for her introduction. Thank you, Robin. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. I am Indu. Thank you for joining in. I come with five years of experience in product management, and I am head handling Provar Labs here at Provar. And um, in my previous experience, I've got an opportunity to uh, work in B two B and B two C products, which includes softwares and mobile applications. So let's get going with the agenda for today. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so uh, we'll begin with a quick introduction. Then uh, we will help you with uh, the basic, simple terms related to AI, and then we will have a look at how AI changes software testing. We'll get going with the challenges with using AI for testing, and then we'll weigh the AI's good and bad points. We'll understand the ethical usage of AI followed by some valuable key takeaways and some question and answer sessions. So I bet you all have heard about AI, chat GPT in the remaining days. I mean, it's crazy. It's everywhere. Like we wake up to an AI news every morning. All the big companies, brands, small companies are coming out and saying, hey, we have AI capabilities in our products. And it's now the big thing in the industry. So before we dive into the world of AI, I have a quick icebreaker question for you guys. Robin, could you please show the question to everyone? Yeah, 100%. And let me also launch this as the poll. So folks, please um, join the poll. Put in your answers. How often do you use a generative AI tool today in your work? Um, generative AI tool could be ChatGPT, could be a large language model, Claude, similar. And what is the frequency? And we'll see um, what are the results and hopefully have an interesting conversation around it. We'll keep the poll running for a minute. On my clock, it says 536. We'll spend 60 seconds so that everybody gets a chance to get their answers in. Yeah, interestingly, <laughs> what I'm seeing on my screen is, is very fun. Um, as I see the numbers increasing towards one value, some folks are still not using it, which is good. Okay. <laughs> okay. We are inching towards a hundred percent participation mark. Ten more folks or so to answer it. Okay. Well, the time ends there. I'll end the poll so that all of us can view the results. Okay. So, Hindu, can you see the results? Oh, yes, I can. Yeah. We have some interesting results. I was not expecting this. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, as per the polls, 39% uh, people use AI on a daily basis. And 20% uh, weekly, 4% monthly, once a month, once, I don't know, in 30 days, they open it. 7% few times a year and 29% don't use generative AI tool. Very interesting results. Um, Indu, yeah. any insights related to that? Any thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, uh, this 29% people saying that they do not use generative AI tool is a little bit surprising for me because I think, you know, uh, this technology is so uh, attractive that people are, you know, just uh, 
rushing towards following it and chat gpt has become like a day to day practice for everyone so i was expecting like people would be more towards the daily and the weekly uh, poll yeah instead of interesting yeah. yeah and adding that to some of the pieces that i'm seeing in chat uh, like that was the expectation but uh, paul also mentions that most workplaces have blocked access to ai sites which i think is a very fair practice and okay. might relate to some of the pieces that we are going to see in this webinar so yeah thanks for the insight paul um also bogdan had caught a bug in the dates earlier so we'll fix that but taha is asking is this webinar only about sales or ai uh, yes and no a little bit sales first a little bit not sales first but generative ai test automation for sure and hello to punit again cool i think these uh, numbers are very interesting uh we are not seeing a landslide of users on on the ai usage so some people are still analyzing assessing and interestingly that is also the topic for this webinar how um ai can not only give us opportunities but also pose hurdles in some of our work but okay with that note i'll stop sharing the results and back to indu for um the slides okay all right so before going on to uh, you know discussing uh, ai on a global scale i think uh, it is important for us to understand ai in simple terms uh, we should understand like what are the common terminologies that are used in ai so that you know we are all on the same page and i think robin would take that over robin if you could please uh, move ahead with the yeah sure explaining ai in simple terms yeah okay cool so there is this meme uh, which i found very interesting uh, and it's about an engineer who goes from uh, ds and algo to neural networks machine learning llms and just skips all those steps and then just goes on to automation agents which i find very funny uh, it, i think that's like my kind of humor but uh, after the launch of chat gpt interestingly people just skipped a lot of these steps and this just then just started integrating um gen ai specifically into their workflows but i feel that we should take it slowly and gradually and therefore we first must understand uh some basics even before we start accessing uh, the hurdles or opportunities so that's my uh, view on the situation so let's start with very basics uh, some of you might know this but for those who don't um uh, a lot of generative ai works on core principles of machine learning which actually work on the principles of neural networks and tensors and perceptrons so let's say we had a statement happy birthday to and this is one of the most famous songs happy birthday to you um which if we run through a small neural network which has three layers input layer the hidden layer and the output layer we will have predictions about the next word based on the training data so again these numbers are for representation only but you like why o u gets 97% probability again this stochastic regression based on the training data what is the probability of the next word after u so maybe u gets 97% robin which is a name uh could get 24% and me for some of the lonely folks get 63% so that is the core principle of any of this generative ai technology interestingly this is the core principle and just like any programming language we can think of this as the building block of a large program right so this is our next word okay i see shrinivas rao has mentioned are you sharing your screen uh, indu can you see my screen yes i can see your screen yeah uh, with the next word prediction yes okay cool cool thank you thank you for the messages okay then i will move along so that is the core uh, element of any ai technology but again this is just the core there are many more building blocks so interestingly in 2017 this pivotal paper came about it's called attention is all you need it's present on rzip.org and it was from a few folks at uh, google interestingly the folks at google started the entire thing but then open ai took that flag and ran with it now here is the interesting piece which happened or uh, which was displayed in this paper the concept of building a generative pre-trained transformer using self attention right so for the same example of happy birthday to you we are not just stacking layers of neurons 
in our case on top of each other in three dimension what we are also doing is that we are tying the relevance of each word with every other word back so think of it as a small feedback loop and not just a small feedback loop we also know that to and you are pretty close to each other so when we train our machine learning models based on that training data it builds relationships between the words and if you just imagine the responses from chat gpt they also stream like that it actually writes word by word so it does some part stochastic regression but also with the added advantage of understanding what is the relevance of each of these words with each other so that is one core concept of a gpt but if we just scale that up we can actually build an llm or a large language model it's it's pretty simple if you get the basics right you take a small chunk of the internet close to 10 terabytes of data put it through 6000 gpus for 12 days around 2 million dollars 1e24 flops it will give you 140 gb file of parameters weights and biases which can be used for building that large language model these numbers are for llama 7b open source model but if you have 2 million dollars a few gpus and a chunk of text you can interestingly train your own llm hopefully the next chat gpt but that is the concept uh, at its root so if we look at the progression right we have algorithm which are just set of instructions on top of algorithms we build the neural network a computer system modeled after the human brain on top of them using the layers of neural networks we build machine learning which is a branch of ai where computers learn and improve from experience on top of machine learning models we build the large language models advanced ai systems that process and generate human like text and then on top of that using multiple large language models we can build automation agents so that is ai in very simple terms hopefully under 5 minutes or so so with that i'll hand it over back to indu thank you robin all right so uh, we all know that uh, software testing is undergoing a transformation like never before and at the heart of this transformation lies the promise and potential of artificial intelligence um we all know that ai is introducing speed intelligence and adaptability into the te testing life cycles but we need to understand like how they are doing it so i will discuss uh, how ai changes software testing and what are the common use cases so we'll move on to the next slide robin okay okay so i'll begin with the first very common use case which is automated test case generation for let's say a uh, salesforce application imagine how awesome it would be that you get access to salesforce environment so rather than you going in and uh, you know probing in everything and creating your test cases manually you ask your uh, ai enhanced uh, test automation tool to generate test cases for you and it automates your testing process which saves so much time and with ai uh, it is possible because ai with natural language process capabilities allows testers to create use cases using plain language which simplifies the testing process and we would also see a further demo of the same test case that we have leveraged into our product which is provard manager another common use case can be automated test uh, data generation so uh, let's take an example um, like you need to check out some data visualization on salesforce but uh, for that you may need like 100 lines of data so uh, like creating 100 lines of data manually it, it is again a very tedious task and it takes so much of your time and it would be uh, very efficient and easy if it is possible with your uh, like testing tool that you're currently using if it has that ai capability and you are able to generate the sample test data uh, let's say for account creation within just seconds so ai has the capability of generating realistic and diverse test data sets covering various scenarios and uh, simplifying the testing process another uh, 
uh, use case that we can see is uh, defect identification with the help of AI. So earlier what used to happen was, and which also happens now as well, that uh, defects are identified by manual uh, process. Uh, so which again takes so much of your time. And we as humans, what if, you know, we miss out on identifying some major defects, which can lead to inaccurate and inefficient testing. What if with the help of AI algorithms, you can continuously monitor your test results and your logs in real time, and hence you can automatically uh, flag the anomalies and potential defects with AI. And uh, another uh, very useful uh, uh, test case can be, uh, use case can be your RCA for fail test, uh, which is the root cost analysis. Like if you're able to identify the root cause of your fail test, just imagine a scenario where AI can automate and enhance the process by collecting and analyzing a wealth of data, identifying patterns and providing insights into the underlying reasons for uh, test failures, which can lead to faster issue re uh, resolution, improved software quality and uh, more of like, you know, a test efficient testing process. So these are some of the common uh, use cases uh, which we can see in the world of software testing. Uh, Robin, if you could please move on to the next slide. So now we will have a glimpse at how we are using AI at Provar, how we have leveraged these use cases into our products. We will begin with uh, test generation with the help of AI in Provar Manager. So we'll show you a video walkthrough of this uh, feature. So once you log into uh, Provar Manager and you know uh, you are there in your story, you just need to uh, provide the issue description. Make sure that your issue description is correct and up to the mark. As correct your issue description would it be, you know, you will get the correct test cases for the same. So uh, here you can see as a user, I want to able to submit a timesheet as well as recall it after it has been submitted so that I can get it approved by my manager. So here with just a few clicks, you can see we have got five test cases generated with the help of the description provided. And you can choose and select the test cases that you want to save. And we have saved it successfully. And now here, you'll be able to see your test cases. And if required, you can even edit them as well, as per your convenience. OK. And uh, another video walkthrough would be of the root cause analysis of feature that we have provided into Provar Manager again. So Robin, if you could please play the next video. Yeah, it seems that slides and Google videos don't play well, but we'll try to make it work for us today. So that's the next one. Yeah, so this is root cause analysis for the failed test cases. So out of all your uh, test cases, you just need to select the failed ones. So as you can see, we have selected these two failed test cases over here. And then once you click on the failed test step execution and you open it, you can see on the right side on top, you can see a button called generate RCA. You just need to click on that button. So once you click on that button, you'll get a pop-up screen. And here, you just again need to click here to generate the root cause analysis report for you. And it would take some time in analyzing your failed test cases. So that happens in the back end. And this would just take nearly about 10 seconds, I think. And you'll be able to see the root cause analysis for your failed test results.
I mean, this can save so much of your time because if you were to do it manually, this the, and you know, uh, we as human testers, it happens so many times that we are not able to find out the correct roots root cause, which leads to inefficient and inaccurate testing. So here you can see the report is generated. So this is the kind of report that you will see. And this is the root cause analysis here. It also provides you with the recommendations and the conclusion at the end. I hope these features were useful. I would definitely love that feature wherein I could click on Jeanette RC as a developer, go get a coffee. By the time I'm back, the RCA is there. <laughs> okay. I'll move on to the next slide. Right. Okay, so like this all looks very appealing, very attracting, the enthusiastic adoption of AI raises important questions about ethical and practical considerations as well. And we must also uh, understand the common challenges we can face while integrating AI into software testing. AI depends a lot on data. It relies heavily on data and we cannot ignore the fact that the effectiveness of AI in testing relies heavily on the quality of training data. So uh, we need to make sure that the data on which it is trained is correct and accurate and it does not lead to any flawed testing outcomes. So if the training data used to teach the AI models is not diverse, the system may not adequately represent the world scenarios, leading to bias testing outcomes, so which is something which we need to take care of, which highlights another challenge, which is bias and fairness. So AI algorithms can inherit biases present in training data, leading to unfair treatment or inaccurate predictions. And uh, another major challenge can be lack of transparency. AI models, uh, especially uh, the complex ones, like the deep neural networks, they may lack transparency, making it challenging to explain the decision-making process. As like, you know, uh, uh, it, the, uh, the models are complex and uh, uh, the transparency is not that much. And uh, we also must understand that there are still companies who are using the legacy systems for software testing. So integrating AI into existing testing processes require careful planning and expertise. So we should not just push ourselves towards AI uh, just, you know, because everyone else is doing it. What if the transition is complex? What if it's time consuming, involving changes in tools, workflows, and the mindset of testing teams. I mean, it can become a headache to the organization and nobody would like that, right? So um, there can be issues related to bias in AI algorithms and ethical considerations, especially in areas um, like data privacy and security. And it can pose challenges, for example, uh, when it comes to Salesforce testing environments, because it deals with a lot of data. And obviously, we would not want to do anything on the sake of the, um, you know, uh, where, wherein we have some uh, security threats. So I think we would not prefer that. So uh, it is very important to watch out for those, uh, you know, who uh, hastily em uh, embrace AI and prioritize technology trends without due consideration over trust and transparency, which is very important. And we must also look out for those who integrate AI, uh, you know, with quick fixes, uh, just like a blind adoption. And we must also watch out for those utilizing AI capabilities without having a strong data security plan in place to protect the end user. Robin, if you could please change the slide. Uh, see, we talked about data privacy, and now here we can 
see the example related to data privacy, uh, related to the negative prompts and jailbreaking. So here you can see two images. One is the chat GPT-4 model refusing a prompt for harmful behavior, followed by a jailbreak attack, leveraging competing objectives that elicits this behavior. Whereas in the second image, you can see Claude uh, 1.3 model refusing the same prompt, followed by a jailbreak attack, uh, leveraging mismatch generalization. So it is very important to uh, take care of these negative prompts and uh, you know uh, the kind of AI models that you're using, they uh, do not get intrigued by these negative prompts. We need to take care of that. Robin, if you could please change the slide again. Thank you. And another uh, you know, uh, thing that we need to take care of is a data accuracy, which is again, very important. And there can be hallucinations when, when it comes to AI. So here, hallucination in AI context refers to AI generated experiences, uh, like for example, any text or any image that do not correspond to the real world input. So here you can see the example that we have shared. So it is just a very simple question that we have asked, like what weighs more, two pounds of feathers or a pound of bricks? So, I mean, anyone can answer that, right? The correct answer should have been two pounds of feathers, but it says two pounds of feathers and a pound of bricks both weigh the same amount, which is obviously not correct. So we need to take care of these hallucinations as well. Robin, if you could please change the slide. Okay, which brings me towards the red flags and green flags, which we need to take care of. So uh, after discussing so much about um, the use cases, the challenges, we are pretty much clear about the green flags. We know what AI gives us. It, it promises automation, it promises efficiency, speed, increased test coverage, data-driven testing. It reduces your manual efforts. It helps you with more accurate uh, test case execution and decision. But what about the red flags? We tend to ignore the red flags because we are so impressed by these green flags that, you know, we think like, oh, it has, it is promising speed. It is promising automation, efficiency. So let's go for this one. But we never thought of the red flags, which is something which is, which is very important in the world of AI. And I think which we should not ignore. So let's get going with the red flags. So as we discussed earlier as well, that um, AI relies heavily on data. So AI that requires access to sensitive data for training and testing without any robust localized data privacy and security measures can pose significant risk to your testing environment. For example, your Salesforce testing environment as it deals with a lot of data, right? Also inherent bias is in AI models can also have uh, very serious consequences in testing rendering your uh, test results and can lead to inaccuracy. Uh, another red flag can be, uh, you know, uh, the AI components that do not seamlessly integrate with your existing tools that we also discussed before, right? So, I mean, this process in itself can be, you know, it can become a headache to the whole organization because it can disrupt the workflows, it can uh, disrupt the efficiency. Um, it can, you know, um, uh, waste a lot of your time as well. And at the same time, uh, nobody talks about these red flags. You will never see people talking that, you know, hey, our, our AI model is, you know, uh, limited with this thing and you need to take care of this because we live in a world where which is flooded with the buzzwords and claims and perhaps the most trending claim that you will ever see is AI powered. Everybody's talking that our tool is AI powered. Our tool is, you know, uh, we are AI powered. And so 
this phrase is not like inherently a red flag but it is something that we need to be attentive of how much the test automation solution is powered when it comes to ai and we need to evaluate if the adoption of ai uh, is useful for us is purposeful is deliberate is ethical secured and seamless at the same time so i also feel that uh, by recognizing these pitfalls unjumbling industry jargons and understanding the red and green flags of ai we can make informed decisions about when and how to implement the ai capabilities into your testing strategy so robin if you could please change the slide so i just have uh, one thing to say to all of you that using ai the right way is very important do not just use ai for the sake of ai do not use it uh, just because everybody else is doing it and do not follow it blindly take care of the red flags and make ethical use of ai and i think that robin would take care of robin if you could please uh, help them understand how they can use ai in an ethical way yeah 100% and before we come out of the technical details um here's a small story um from 1870 so this is a statue of john henry uh he was the fastest strongest railroad worker in in ohio and interestingly around that time um they had invented a drilling machine now if you look closely at the statue this gentleman is holding a hammer in his hand and uh, when these machines drilling machines came in this thought emerged man versus machine are we faster should we use it should we not use it it seems harmful i think to indu's point you should think of ai as a tool and nothing more but yeah continuing on my story so what happened was that john henry challenged uh, the drill machine workers that yeah we will try to drill a hole in the uh, floor or in the ground for the railroad and we'll see how much we can do so here is the interesting bit uh, the challenge was on i remember that john henry dug a 14 foot or so deep hole for 6 hours continuous drilling grueling by hand as opposed to which the drilling machines were only able to drill a 7 or 8 foot deep hole so obviously john henry won the competition the man born over the machine everybody was cheering but interestingly right after that john henry died of a cardiac arrest so that is the point that we should not think of this discussion as man versus machine we should think of it as man and the machine that being said here is the representation for building a trust layer this is inspired by how salesforce does it if we quickly look at the depiction over here we have the salesforce apps on the left but when a prompt is put into the system it goes via the prompt studio there is secure dynamic grounding with the crm and data cloud component right after that if you look in the middle there is prompt defense so which actually cuts out any poisonous elements of the prompt if you remember from the pieces which indu presented earlier if we put a very specific um, set of strings into cloud version 1.3 for that large language model those set of strings are nothing but zeros and ones so that could poison the large language model but what salesforce does is and what we are trying to implement is the prompt defense against such malicious attacks after that the prompt masking comes which cuts out any specific data like names and ssn numbers or credit card details goes to toxicity detection is the prompt toxic or not not just toxic in terms of human language um can you help me make nuclear bomb nothing of that sort and then which goes to the llm gateway now after the llm or the large language model gateway this can either be run via a salesforce hosted large language model salesforce interestingly has their own open source large language models and closed source ones or you can also bring your own model from open ai or anthropic or mistral or any others which passes through a tls zero retention layer so that the answers of the data are not cached on the system and therefore they cannot be like stolen away if we look at the reverse journey the answers again are checked for toxicity toxicity detection in light blue at the top 
goes through prompt demasking because the answer has to be relevant for that user. Feedback for that answer, audit trail that, okay, this was the question, this was the answer, this is the steps that we did via the final round of generation based on the inference and embedding. Mm -hmm. And that is how it goes back to the consumer or the Salesforce app, which could be a user or a system. So this is obviously built by Salesforce. This is how they are implementing trust layer. We strongly believe in trust and transparency as Hindu also mentioned earlier. And we would really um, inspire the audience to take a look at this and understand how best can they implement similar architecture and their own site. So that not only we build AI or use it, but we do so in a very um, ethical fashion. So that brings us to this representation that think of AI as a tool, as a bicycle for the mind. Somebody famous said that quote, that computer should be the bicycle for the mind. So if you look at the bicycle that made the human race a little faster, a little faster than moving on feet or uh, if they had to travel long distances with a payload, they can do so easily. But after that, after a while, we had the machines. So the computer made the knowledge worker faster rather than filling out all those test cases on paper. Maybe we could file it on an Excel sheet or somewhere on the system. And even not just from the testing domain, but also from all other domains, we could do the knowledge flow a lot faster. What happened after that is at some point in history, we had the internet which made this flow further more faster and also efficient. But just like internet made us a whole lot faster, but a little bit unsafe. Similarly, we should be mindful of ethical usage of AI. And then if you look at the most recent evolution in that story, humans and large language models will help us not only go faster, but in a more efficient fashion. But at the same time, we have to be cognitive of some of the issues which Hindu presented as jailbreaking or deliberate prompt injections so that not only we use AI, we use it in a responsible fashion. Okay, that brings us to some of the key takeaways. We at Prova believe in the gift of knowledge. Interestingly, Christmas is also coming up. So folks can attend the courses from the Prova uh, University. We have three, uh, AI for desktop automation, AI for software quality assurance, and introduction to AI and software quality. Uh, you can go over prova.p slash paths and complete the courses. All participants that complete these three courses stand a chance to win um, exclusive Prova swag. Uh, don't forget to enter your registration details from this webinar when you complete the courses. So all through this presentation, we were trying to go into some details. But I personally believe that while you can build with AI, build for AI, test with AI or test for AI, we should all start first learning about AI so that we do the other activities in a more knowledgeable fashion. That being said, you can also chat with one of our experts. Uh, you can scan the QR code generated by AI responsibly using Provar's URL and get in touch with one of our experts. I'll stay over here for a minute here so that people can check out your smartphones and maybe scan this. Okay. That brings us to the most important section of the webinar Q&A. We have some in the chat. I'll quickly go over them. And while we do that, you are more than welcome to ask all the tough questions in the chat and we'll see if we can answer them. If we can't answer them, maybe we'll ask chat GPT. I'm just kidding, we'll not ask chat GPT. Okay, so I'm starting from the top. Um, okay, I mentioned around the notes on dates. Okay. Okay, uh, Mark Berry mentioned a very important point, uh, not using as much AI as would do until certainty around privacy and security is resolved. I don't want to ask an internal document to be summarized if there is a risk that the document is in effectively public domain, which I think is a very strong point that uh, in recent days, uh, we would have seen the advancements around custom GPTs, wherein you can put in uh, your own documentation and create a custom GPT 
like a retrieval augmented generation model wherein you can ask questions but if you don't set a system prompt correctly you can literally ask for the whole training documentation which was provided to mark's point which won't be very good okay the scrolling further down thanks to amber for all the resources uh, if folks want resources and links they are in the chat okay um Parthiban is asking, is it possible that we end up exposing sensitive confidential data while leveraging the AI capabilities to generate tests and test data? Yes, 100% that is possible, Parthiban. Um, as we saw in those examples, with certain string um, formats or with certain inputs, we can definitely ask AI for the training data. And if the system prompt is not set up correctly, or if the large language model is not implemented correctly, it has the capability to just expose all of that. Interestingly, I don't know if you have noticed or not, uh, ChatGPT tries to be very friendly. It tries to please you with the answer, right? Rather than being defensive, it actually tries to give you the answer, even if it is made up. In this case, in Parthiban's case, maybe that could actually be the document, which you can ask in various ways. And again, some of us are testers, some of us are developers, some of us are both. We can model the question in that way, that the AI can actually provide the training document considering sensitive information. Rahul asks, uh, this has been generated and integrated within the Salesforce. I think this is for the demo which Indu did. Yes, this has been generated and integrated within a Salesforce app. Uh, so we provide Provar Manager and both uh, test case generation and generative RCA are provided on top of Salesforce's layer. Puneet asks, could you please share the example of root cause analysis? Uh, yes, Puneet. I think the recordings will be shared post the session. So that would definitely be shared. Thanks to Amber for the links and resources. Mark Berry asks, um, I'm still confused about security. Does asking ChatGPT or the tool being demoed to summarize any test cases from corporate effectively make the text public domain? That's slightly tough to say. Interestingly, um, if we connect with Okay, let me take an analogy over here. If we host some of our data in a S3 bucket, S3 bucket is simple storage service on Amazon or AWS. So let's say we store something on an S3 bucket. But interestingly, there are many ways to implement an S3 bucket in AWS. And there is something which is called as a leaky bucket. So if you put the data there, even that can be attacked and the data can be extracted. Not exactly the same, but AI can also have similar pitfalls that if we put it, on a vector database, it can actually be attacked as long as it's available for a user. Malicious actors using um, jailbreaks or negative prompts can access it. So there is a possibility. Slim or fact is a different question, but to some extent, yes. Um, okay, going forward, could you please repeat which three courses from Prova University? Yeah, hundred percent. I can repeat that. Um, that is. Okay. Introduction to AI in software quality, AI for software quality assurance, and AI for test automation. Those are the courses. Okay. I think Amber also mentioned that. Cool. I think that was the last question or so around 6.30. Okay. Yeah, Mark uh, is asking, I'm not talking about security at that level, but the fact that ChatGPT will take your secure document and it becomes part of its learning. I think um, as far as I have read uh, ChatGPTs or OpenAI's privacy policy, even for custom GPTs, they mentioned that uh, they will not use that data for their own training purposes. They do, in my own experience, ask you, if you're building a custom GPT, that would you like the feedback to be shared with OpenAI or some parts of the prompt data, but not the training data. So as per their privacy policy, they don't use um, specifically the documents that we provide for their own training pur purposes. But this is me referring to something um, which I read one and a half months back. Interestingly, in the world of OpenAI, a lot has changed as we have seen in the last one and a half month. So I don't know what has changed on the privacy policy. Okay, cool. Another question, uh, what skills do testers need to develop to work effectively with AI in testing? That's a very good question. Uh, thank you for that, Amber. So one I would say is that start simple. 
first understand what's a large language model and think of it as a programming language like how you would use java for let's say writing a test automation software is similar to how you would use a large language model for generating some of the test cases right so how to go about the learning process you can start very non technical or maybe with some of the very friendly courses that we have on the university of prova and then slowly gradually ramp up on some of the technical ones maybe using open ai or building a custom gpt something like that but what skills do testers need i think this is that time in our lives that all of us need the ai skills and not only do we need to understand how llms work we need to really understand how can this supplement us how can it become man and the machine to solve some of the use cases so that's my take uh, indu has a different take or a similar one on that question no i totally agree that we need to balance it between ai and humans and i think uh, uh, if uh, we are able to uh, go hand in hand then it would be great when it comes to testing so we need to be uh, we need to begin with the learning process as robin suggested and we should start sim- simple so probably uh, they can start with the provar courses as well because they are also like quite simple and like if somebody who doesn't have uh, such a background even they can also begin with those courses so i think that can be like an additional recommendation yeah thank you for that insight indu okay i think that was the last any other closing questions in 10 seconds no okay that brings us to the most important slide <laughs> thank you team for this fun session um it was great having all of you once again thank you for the host and participants uh and the prova team for putting this together and obviously the audience for making it a lively session with all these lovely questions uh, we will send across the recording and thank you once again bye bye for now mm-hmm.